Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today I'm kind of excited because something was dropped off. They want some help with something. And uh, I happen to have a little bit of experience with these items. Let's take a look at a hydrocolator or a hydrocolator, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so this, this unit, it's, it's rather large and they say that its issue is it's not getting above a certain temperature. Well, there are some things that we should consider when you get that kind of report, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at the unit. We'll go over it, its functionality, and let's take a look at what I think the problem is. All right, guys, here is the big boy himself. This is an M4 Chattanooga hydrocolator, hydrocolator, whatever you want to call it. It's basically for heating up packs that are using physical therapy. And there's a nice echo when I open that up. That's how big it is. <laughs> so down there in the bottom, we have a pan that's not supposed to be sitting there. But besides that, there is a few things going on. What is this? What is this? It's not, that's not supposed to happen. What's going on? What's going on? Here's this guy. I have not looked inside here yet, by the way. So this guy right here is supposed to be for that. This is not supposed to be wrapped around that. And this is supposed to be linear, like right here alongside the line. What is going on? Okay, guys. So we have a damage. Uh, this would be your uh, temperature management. And this one right here is your over temp. Okay. So uh, an over temp will disconnect um, and you know you can reset it by uh, a resettable breaker in the back. And this one here is your uh, thermostat. So uh, these are capillary tubings and inside this is a liquid. And what happens is when that liquid expands, uh, it expands and pushes. This is a hollow tube. It looks like a, a solid core conductor, but it's not. It's a hollow tube. It's called capillary tubing. And you see right here, oh gosh, geez, it's wrapped around. Oh my God. Okay. So this capillary tubing right here, you can see that what they do is they fill it up and then they crimp it off. And as it expands, it goes down below to an electrical plunger. So a plunger that hits a micro switch. This one here activates on the disconnect for temperature. This one here is for a resettable breaker. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look down below, but first let me go ahead and draw for you a rough schematic of what we're going to be looking at here. Okay. Let's take a look at electrical schematic, and <laughs> maybe a, a fluid schematic so you can see these components and you'll understand more about what's going on, especially now that I see it. This guy was wrapped around and this guy here is crushed. I, whatever. Let's go ahead, let's take a look at the schematics. Okay guys, over here on my whiteboard of learning, we're gonna go ahead and draw out the rough schematic of what is going on inside one of these hydrocolators. So in order to do that, we are gonna have two different colors, one blue and one orange, because one of them is gonna be for fluids or for pressure, and the other one is gonna be for electrical. So let's see, we are gonna use blue for the fluid and pressure. We're gonna use the orange for electrical. Okay, so this device does not convert anything over to DC. It, it runs strictly off AC. It's everything's analog, which means, you know, there's no circuit theory, uh, no digital circuit theory, no uh, microchips, none of that. This is very analog. It's an old design, but it works. And that's why it's important for you to understand how this works. So over here, let's see, we got our plug, which are AC mains in, okay, and that signifies AC. And then we have our two lines coming in, all right? All right, so this one comes over here. And let's see, on this one here for neutral, uh, first it goes through a fuse. And this one over here goes through a fuse. Neutral, and this one here is line or hot. 
These are 120 volts. Uh, so they're both hot and neutral are switched and then it goes into the next major component. After the fuse, neutral should go almost directly to the heating element. So let's go over here and let's keep going because this is a big heating element, all right? Okay, so this is our main heating element, which you've seen in the cavity of the device where uh, it wraps around the perimeter. So I did several other videos on heating elements. Your heating element is a giant resistor. Your resistor is going to be, well, it's going to be between probably 6 ohms and 14 ohms, something like that. We can probably take a measurement and see what it is. Um, in this type of system, your heating element is always all the way on or all the way off. So one of the things you can do to figure out how much resistance is here in this heating element is you go ahead and take a look at the build sticker on the device and see how many watts the device is supposed to pull. You can actually have cal uh, calculators online where you can go in, you can type in your watts, your voltage, and it will give you your resistance, it's Ohm's law, but there's calculators for that. All right, so we don't know this value yet. I'm guessing it's between six and let's say 14 ohms, okay? Something like that. And you guys can do Ohm's law to figure it out. This guy here says it pulls 1,000 watts. Okay, 1,000 watts. All right, so all the activity is gonna happen on the line side. All right, so after F1, you are going to go into your master shutoff, which is your resettable breaker. Okay, so this is your resettable breaker, RB. And let's say that it's temperature set for, hmm, let's say 200 degrees. And that's Fahrenheit, okay? So your resettable breaker, let's say it's uh, 200 degrees. Now this device, normally operates in most places at 160 degrees. So that is gonna be your next one. So it's gonna go from resettable breaker over to a thermostat, which is almost exactly like a resettable breaker, except it's got a, uh, a variable switch that is spring-loaded. Here, okay. So imagine like a micro switch, because that's technically what's inside it, and you have a thumb screw, which is what adjusts the pressure on a spring, and the more pressure on the spring means it takes more fluid pressure, more expansion, in order for it to trip the, the micro switch. So this one here is gonna be uh, TH1, so that's thermostat one. And then from here, it goes to, let's see, there's gonna be a light over here. So imagine a little wire coming over, coming up, coming down here. And this one here is gonna be an LED. And then over here, after the thermostat, there's going to be a, um, there's gonna be a light also. Let's do this. That's probably pretty accurate. So this one here is LED2, this is LED1. I know that's not how you draw an LED, it's normally a triangle and a line and some zigzags, um, but we're gonna write it in. Okay, so we got LED1, we have LED2, and uh, after all this, it comes down to your heating element, H1. So when you apply power, the resettable breaker is closed, your thermostat is closed, and then uh, you should see LED2 light up. Okay, so that's pretty much the rough circuit diagram. Everything's in series. So if anything breaks, if F2, F1 breaks, if your resettable breaker shuts off, um, if your uh, Thermostat opens up, it disconnects the heating element. All conditions mean that the heating element is de-energized. All right, so for pressure, we have um, down here in your heating element, you'll have one which is a coil. And that's gonna come all the way up here to your resettable breaker. 
and there's going to be like a giant plunger. Okay. And then over here, we are going to have a bulb. And then this line is going to go all the way up here to this. Oh, well, we got a bleeder. So inside this bulb is a fluid. And inside this capillary tube over here is also a little bit of fluid. So what happens is inside the reservoir with the heating element, it's going to expand the fluids in each one of these capillary tubes. And that expansion is going to push on electrical components down underneath. Now, these are two separate values. Your thermistor should always trip first, okay? So your thermistor, let's say that we set this one here at, we try to get around 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and your resettable breaker, yeah, around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So that means that if your thermistor ever malfunctions and it doesn't shut off, it's gonna to continue to rise pressure in this coil over here, and that fluid pressure is gonna travel up this hollow tube and it's gonna push on a plunger. Just like that. So it's gonna push on a plunger, which is going to disconnect uh, your resettable breaker. Actually, let's, let's do it correct. Uh, let's see, this is gonna be up here. There we are. Okay, so your resettable breaker, it's gonna push on it, it's gonna open that connection and it's going to light up this LED right here. Uh, you have to push it once it cools back down to reset it, and then it will go back into a normal heat cycle. You should never reset it without investigating why is it tripping. Now this one over here, it's got a larger reservoir of fluid, so it's going to expand much faster than this one over here, and it's set for a lower temperature. Now I'm not really sure if, if your uh, thermal cutoff is set at 200 degrees, it's probably reasonably close because that's that's really going to burn your patients. But your thermistor is adjustable. It's got a tension screw that we can screw down and put more pressure or less pressure on the spring, which is going to open or close that switch sooner or later. Okay, so that's basically what we're seeing inside this device. Let's go ahead and let's take a look inside the device and maybe you'll spot a problem that I've seen immediately. Okay, so the symptom is is that the device is only getting up to around 100 degrees. Well, I can tell you for a fact, I mean, it could be uh, this guy here is adjusted incorrectly, your thermistor. But it's almost certainly not normally this guy right here because it trips after your thermistor, all right? So your thermostat, let's call it a thermostat. So if it's only getting up to 100 degrees, it's either an electrical issue or it's a pressure issue with one of our pressure management. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's see if we can spot the problem. This is the rear panel of the M4 hydrocolator. So we have our thermostat, which is adjustable, and then we have our over temp control, which has its own little light right here. There is one light, which is on the front panel. So the light that I said was going to shine when it's in an over temp condition is this one right here. So this one here is normally a closed circuit, and then when it opens, that creates a difference of potential between hot and neutral, and that's why this guy lights up. Down here, I have some of those components actually sitting here. You can see our resettable unit right there. And you can see our thermostat, which is our adjustable unit right here. Now, there's nothing much on here because this is usually a set it once and leave it. And if they were to put an actual knob on this guy, users would be adjusting it all the time. This guy is a large stainless steel tub of liquid. It takes hours for this guy to normalize out and establish a standard temperature. It ramps up really hot and then it goes a little over temperature and then it cools down to its, its settling temperature. And that's how this guy is going to operate because it's all analog. So if the users are adjusting it because it's not hot enough, well maybe it was just turned on recently and now you're going to be burning your patients because you cranked it down. So inside this guy, this is a threaded fastener. Uh, it's not even really a fastener, it's a threaded screw. And uh, as you turn it, it's pushing or removing pressure on a diaphragm, a spring-loaded diaphragm. And these little capillary tubes coming down here that you see, these capillary tubes are hollow 
And these are the ones where the steam pressure or the, uh, the air pressure that's inside them from the expanding liquids that we talked about, it's going to push on the backside of that switch and try to open that switch. This here is preventing it from opening. So as you crank it down, you're putting more pressure against it or you're removing pressure from it by loosening it up. This guy here is the device that I said is going to also have a plunger inside it. And it does have a capillary tube coming from behind it. You can see it right there. Now these are delicate normally. Um, these ones are all going to get replaced. But guys, I hope by now that you have seen a bigger problem. You can see it right there. What is going on? I see some weak connections. Look at that. See it moving with just one finger? Oh yeah. <laughs> Take a look at this connection. Wow, there we go. So those two right there are definitely defective. So what happens is when there's a poor connection and high amperage, which this is a thousand watts, it's gonna pull full power on or full power off. There is no slight on, there's no rheostat in there, so it might be half voltage. No, it's full current, full voltage, and then when it reaches its temperature, it disconnects. And what it does is if you get the wrong size connectors or if these connectors even get a little bit loose, it will create hot spots. And hot spots are the enemy of electronics. Take a look at that. So what I've got to do is I have to trace back, and this is all discolored right here. You can see it's all crumbly, in fact. And let's see, is this guy loose? Oh yeah, look at that. You see that? That is a no-go for a high current device. Those connectors have to be tight, really tight. So what I've got to do is I've got to trim back the wire and test it for oxidation. You can see the wires right here. This is an example of the oxidation. See how it's discolored? That's due to heat. Heat will oxidize copper rather quickly. So I've got to trim it back. I've got to put on some proper crimp connects. And then I'm going to go ahead and change out all these components right here because somebody's clearly been in here already playing around with stuff. You can see the F1 and F2 that I was talking about. So your mains comes in the device and it goes immediately through those large bus fuses. And then way up there, you can see the wires kind of go into it. Actually, what? Oh, yeah, there it is. There's a blue and a brown wire. So this wire right here is actually your, um, that's your main heating element. So when the heating element is on, there's a difference of potential between that blue and that brown, and that is your front indicator light. It should be lit up. So this device is not as bad a condition as some of them that I've seen. These ones right here are a little bit corroded. And since they're a little bit corroded, I have to strip those out. I'll clean it with a wire brush. Um, this is stainless steel. Stainless steel has an oxidized layer. And that oxidized layer, when, when it gets a little bit of rust on it, its integrity is now in jeopardy. So you have to clean off that oxidation, like right there at the base around those fasteners, the through panels, and clean it off really good. And then we can go ahead and uh, put the new components through the panel. So guys, there you go. We've got a few problems with this guy. Look at that, that is so <laughs> loosey goose. That is not okay. Oh, so. That being said, you guys also seen when I first opened this up that my over temp right here was wrapped directly around the heating element. Now these guys are supposed to be mounted in these standoffs so that they're actually floating out here in the water bath because if it's directly wrapped around your heating element, as soon as your heating element gets up to, I don't know, anything over 160 degrees, it's gonna start boiling off the liquid inside here. And it actually will damage the system because it's not meant to have such high pressure in there. So what you're doing is you're immediately tripping the unit with a thermal over temp. And that's because you had your thermal over temp cable wrapped around the heating element. And even this guy right here is supposed to be mounted probably right here linear to this offset about that far. So I'm gonna mount this one right here, just like that. I'm gonna mount this one right here, just like that. So 
I can see some of these rubber grommets. They're aging. These ones down here are aging. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to clean this guy up with a wire brush, remove all these components, start again. Sound good? All right, guys. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and start removing some components. But when we do, what we should do is use something I call the dot code. So on this component here, I'm going to place a single dot on the adjacent terminal, place a single dot, and then on the component I'm removing, I'm going to put a single dot. So I know that the, the single dots are for the thermal cutoff breaker. Next, I'm going to put two dots on this component, just like that. Then the two terminals, two dots. All right, so now I can freely disconnect these devices like so and remove them from the device chassis. All right, so all these components are good. Everything's disconnected. I can just pull them out. And now I know exactly where my wires are supposed to go. Now what I will do next is, even though I have single dots on these, Remember, I still have to go up the wire and re-terminate it. So my wire, I'm gonna do the same thing. Single dot, further up. You see the discoloration in this cable right here? Most of it's discolored, so further up, I'm gonna place a single dot. And let's see, These t this one right here doesn't look too bad. So I'll put two dots on this one. And this wire right here is a little bit brown. So it gets two dots. All right, so now even when I cut this terminal off and move it up, I still have my two dots that tells me exactly where I gotta plug it in. But let's go ahead and take a look at something else I found up in here. All right, so look at my fuse blocks. See the wires up on those fuses? Look at those terminals. So here we go again. Notice how the blues are connected to one fuse, the browns are connected to another. Browns are gonna be your hot, blues are gonna be your neutral. Pretty simple, blue comes in, goes through the fuse, as I said in the schematic, and then it comes over to your heating element. All right, here's one of the wires that goes up to the heating element. You can see that up by the heating element itself, it is rusted. And that is definitely contributing to some of this problem. And it's discolored down here. So what we gotta do is we gotta trim the wire off, get to fresh looking copper, beautiful. We gotta trim it back. So when we trim it back, we wanna see if it's oxidized. See, this one here is still a little oxidized. So we gotta cut it back even further. Oh, that's beautiful. You're looking for that nice shiny copper look. Much better. Okay, so once we get our nice looking copper, what we have to do is come up with, let's see, I have a red, black. So what I'm gonna do on this piece is I'm going to heat shrink it. This is dual layer heat shrink tube. I'm going to put that on first. Got my crimp terminal and my crimping pliers. There. Crimp it really good. All right. Beautiful. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the heat shrink up and over the terminal just like this. I'm going to shrink it down. So I'm going to use red for the hot and I'm going to use the black for the neutral. There we go. So this is dual layer heat shrink which means that there is going to be some adhesive that squeezes out at both the ends. That's really good. Adds uh, extra thermal protection and at the same time it's going to prevent uh, things like water ingress. This end down here, I gotta trim it back a wee little ways. 
Some nice fresh copper looking there. Very good. Actually, if you can get some of those copper bristles, it's not good enough. Still a little oxidized. It's looking better. All right. Let's go ahead and take the other side of this. Thread it on. Crimp connect. Beautiful. Do it all over again. Now I'm going to go through the rest of the wires down there, re-terminate them in the same manner, making sure that they're all insulated and at the same time properly tensioned, and then we'll put the components back in. All right, heating elements out, through wall components are out. Now I have some corrosion down there, and I've got some corrosion on the lip, some odd spots. So what we're going to do. We're going to take an abrasive brush and some lubricant, like some silicone, and spray it around. That will help dissolve some of those deposits, which actually happens kind of quickly. And then we're going to brush it out. So we're going to go around, clean out all the corrosion that's on those through panel fittings, and then uh, put the new components in. All right, so the basin has been brushed, the corrosion's gone, the lid has been brushed, corrosion's gone, and the lip, which had corrosion all around the lip, scaling, it's all gone, and in there there's a seam down near the basin. It it's all gone too. So we're ready to put the components in. Okay, the next step. These right here are the clamps that hold the uh, temperature monitoring equipment to the heating element, and these were flat. So what I first did is I eliminated all of the corrosion, which you can see, and then what I had to do is form them, and that's why I also keep around a lot of dies and forms and chisels and stuff is because when you need it, you need it. And you can see right there, it's got the figure eight type profile. Heating element goes in the back, temperature monitoring equipment goes in the front, and then it clamps down like that and holds everything a very specific distance away from one another. So that's the clamps, they're cleaned up. We're gonna install them next. All right guys, final checkout. Let's go ahead and take a look at all the things that have been done. It's finally ready a couple hours later. All right, so first off, foremost, down here, let's take a look. This is the rear panel. Thermostat, breaker, IEC. So the cabling has been redone. Everything's been run. You see all those, the new connections. Some of the old connections. But the bottom pan, which covers all this, uh, I have not added that yet. I want to do the water check first, where we add water, and then we check to see if there's any uh, leaks coming through right here. And uh, if there is, then we're gonna do an all stop and then uh, check it out. But right now, I've tensioned everything. Um, the rubber gaskets are compressed on these two, actually these four. <laughs> One, two, three, four all those through panel fittings. So let's take a look inside the cabinet and let's check out the finished product. All right, so here we are. The beautiful interior now that all the corrosion's cleaned up. New heating element, new thermostat, new overtemp protection. It's all in, everything's set. There's a basket that sits in here and that's got risers for all the different hot packs. But uh, 
Yeah, the basin's been cleaned. It's beautiful. So guys, um, hope you like this little walkthrough. I've been meaning to do one of these uh, hydroculators for a while. Just haven't had the opportunity to like really get down to the meat and taters of one, you know, because I've, I'm usually in the field. But since this one was getting dropped off here at my house, I couldn't miss the opportunity. So anyway, thanks for watching and uh, I hope you like this video. Hope you learned a little something more about hydrocolators or hydroculators. <laughs> thanks for watching, guys.